This Rabbi Yaakov Wolby podcast is sponsored by Fabuloso Household Care Rabbi Cleaner. Pastor, Fill I your home with joy. No ads on my podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Tyson's Face Tats. No Have ads. you ever wanted to look like. No sponsorships. Average Rabbi, please. Bill and Anthony's Daily Multivax. Order your six month supply Rabbi with Pastor, promo code TORCH for 10% average off. Average Rabbi. No ads. No sponsorships. No promo codes. But this is how we make money. This is not how we make money. This is not how we make money. I, I will not subject. My podcast listeners, the listeners that I love, the listeners that want to come hear Torah and hear words of wisdom and learn about their heritage and learn about Jewish history and learn about Jewish values and connect themselves with the Almighty and connect themselves with His Torah and deepen their bond with their soul. I'm not going to have readouts. Rabbi Basto, my dear colleague, I'm not going to do it. Rabbi, well, we have bills to pay. Uh, so what's the other option? Is there anything else we could do? We need help. Oh, okay. Well, maybe we, maybe we do something else. You see, most podcasts, they have to pay their bills and they have ads and they have readouts and they have promo codes and they have Dollar Shave Club and Geico and mattresses. I don't want to sell you mattresses. I want to give you what you come for. I want to give you Torah. I want to give you wisdom from the Almighty. I want to give you a connection with our glorious religion and glorious heritage. But we need to pay our bills. So what we do is that we don't do any ads. No ads. No, no matter how much the average rabbi, my colleague, Rabbi Busto, insists on doing the ads, insists on doing these promo codes, none of that. We do an annual fundraiser, and that's happening right now. And the website for that is givetorch.org. Give, the word give, to give. Give your heart. Give your soul. Give a little boost, a little bit of love to Torch. Give Torch.org. It's happening right now. Every donation is doubled. This is our only annual fundraiser. We do this once a year. Until next year, you're not going to hear about this. It's happening now. If, you, if you're hearing this right now, you should know that it's still active. Every donation is doubled. And yes, Robert Busco, he's insistent. He's insistent. Are you insistent? Well, if there's a better a little solution. Bit. I do like the multivax. <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll make a little exception for that. But no ads. That, that's the plan. We've done now podcasts since 2012, 12 years, and we're committed to this. We're committed to connecting Jews and Judaism locally in Houston and globally throughout our podcast and the many other digital offerings that we have here at Torch. We do one fundraiser a year and we want your support. Visit givetorch.org. Right now, press pause on the podcast. Press pause. Stop the podcast. GiveTorch.org. Make a donation. And then, you know, for the rest of the year, you are partnering with us. We're not going to bombard you with ads. We're not going to bombard you with fundraising emails every day, every week, every month. Once a year, we try to get everyone to give, everyone to contribute. If you appreciate our work, if you enjoy our work, if you want to support our work, if you want to support the great rabbis here at the Torch Center, Rabbi Busto, the average rabbi, and everyone else that's over here, and all the incredible work that we do here from the Torch Center Houston, Texas, visit givetorch.org right now and make a donation. Show us some love. We're not gonna, we're not gonna drive you crazy. Make the donation. Of course, my email address is rabbiwolbajima.com and that website again, givetorch.org. There's a theme that I noticed, not only in this parsha, in last parsha, in the previous parsha, and the more I researched it, and the more I thought about it, I started to see it everywhere, and I believe it can be life changing. It's like a like a framework that is radically different than what we are accustomed to, and I think it also has a very valuable and important lesson. So our parsha begins right where we left off last week. Jewish people are enslaved, and Moshe has been hired for the sacred task of leading the Jewish people out of Egypt. His first effort was a total failure, and he went back to God and complained back to God and said, why did you send me on this? You didn't save the nation. Their situation got worse. And amidst that conversation, the Parsha ends last week, and it pitched up again right where it left off this week. And the Almighty tells Moshe, it's time to go back, time to speak to Pharaoh, time to speak to the Jewish people. We are going to get this exodus underway. So Moshe goes to speak to the Jewish people, 
and they don't listen to him. And Moshe goes back to God and says, well, how, Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. If the Jews don't listen to me, certainly Pharaoh won't listen to me. And the Almighty seems to ignore it and says, that's it. We're on. Go speak to Pharaoh. We're going to begin the Exodus. And then the verse pivots to give us the genealogy, the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron. And it starts off by giving us the pedigree, the genealogy of the children of Ruvain, and the children of Ruvain, and then the children of Shimon, and finally the sons of Levi. It tells us who her sons were, and then it tells us how Moshe is related to this family, Moshe and Aaron. It gives us the whole attribution of the families of Levi until we get to Moshe and Aaron. And finally, it wraps up this genealogy by telling us that this is Aaron and Moshe and this is Moshe and Aaron. It switches their names. Rashi tells us because they're really equal. They're a team. These are the ones that God said to the God appointed to go release the Jewish people from Egypt. They're the ones who support the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. They are Moshe and Aaron. This is chapter 6. So again, the genealogy starts from chapter 6, verse 14, and it ends verse 27. So there's a very interesting Rashi I want to share with you. On verse 27, Rashi says, what does it mean? He is, or they are, Moshe and Aaron. So Rashi says, really short Rashi, they are in their mission, in their righteousness, from beginning to end. When it tells us that someone is this person, Says Rashi, it's telling us that these people, they are Moshe and Aaron. It means something fixed about them. There's something that is immovable about them from beginning to end in their mission. They maintained their righteousness. And there is a praise here being conveyed about Moshe and Aaron that they were unflappable. They were the same Moshe and Aaron, the same Aaron and Moshe from beginning to end. They had unwavering Consistency. Now Rashi gets this from the Talmud, the book of Megillah, page 11a. And the Talmud describes this quality to other people as well. So for example, there's a verse that says, Avram, who Avraham, Abraham is Abraham. Again, the same word, like they are Moshe and Aaron. Who Moshe Avraham, who Avraham, says the Talmud. Who betzitko, he was righteous. Mitchilaso, fa'at sofa, from beginning to to end from when Abraham was called Abraham until he was called Abraham. His entire life was a complete, uninterrupted continuum of righteousness. And then it tells us Aaron and Moshe, Moshe and Aaron, they were the same from beginning to end. And then it quotes a verse about David. David was humble when he was a simpleton, when he was a shepherd, and once he became a king, he was an all-powerful monarch, and nevertheless, he maintained his humility. These are some of the giants of our history. Abraham, Moshe, Aaron, David. These are total giants, and they are all praised by having this same characteristic. The mark of a giant is that they are resolute. They are unflappable. Their successes, don't change them, don't alter them. Their triumphs, don't ruin them. Moshe and Aaron, when they started, they were kind of no-names. You know, no one really knew who they were. They didn't really have any successes. And then after they conquered everything and they led the Exodus and they brought down the manna and gave us the Torah, everything, 40 years of brilliant, consummate leadership, they maintained the righteousness it didn't get to their head, as we say here in America. They maintained and preserved their level. Moshe and Aaron are praised like this. Abraham is praised for having this quality. David is praised for their consistency throughout their life. Now, I think it's an amazing thing. These giants are praised not for their level of righteousness, but for the duration of righteousness. From beginning to end, Abraham, David, Moshe, and Aaron maintained the same level. 
The great praise of Moshe and Aaron was that they stayed the same. Same thing Abraham and David. You would think that, you know, the great heights that they accomplished, the amazing things that they earned, those high levels that they reached, that's what we would imagine that they would be praised for. But here we see that they are praised for really remaining the same, for being steady, for preserving and not changing. Abram has this quality. David has this quality. Moshe and Aaron have this quality as well. But it doesn't stop there. In last week's Parsha, Parshas Shemos, the beginning of the book of Exodus, the fifth verse, it's again delineating the families, the descendants of Jacob. And it tells us that the souls that came out of Jacob's thigh were 70 souls. This is the fifth verse of the parasha, of the book, really. V'yosef haya b'mitzrayim. And Joseph was in Egypt. So Rashi says, wait a minute, there's a problem. It's delineating, we're talking about the 70 souls. Well, included in the 70 souls was Joseph. So what's it telling us? That Joseph was in Egypt. Don't we know that he was in Egypt? What is this little addendum to the verse? What is it adding? Says Rashi, Lehodiacha tzidkaso shal Yosef, to reveal to you the righteousness of Joseph. Who Yosef Aroes so naviv? This is the same Joseph that was a shepherd for his father's flock. Who Yosef shahayim Mitzrayim? This is the same Joseph that was in Egypt. Venasemelech and became a king, the Omeid Bitsiko, and nevertheless maintained his righteousness. Like Moshe and Aaron, like Abraham and David, Joseph was unflappable. No matter what happened to him, he remained the way he was, the same purity, the same humility, the same righteousness, the same tenacious resistance to temptation, the same faith, all the circumstances didn't alter Joseph. When he was a shepherd for Jacob, when he was a slave in Egypt, when he was a king in Egypt, it was the same Joseph with the same righteousness. So this list of giants who are praised for their consistency is growing. We have Moshe, and Aaron, Abraham, David, and now Joseph. But it doesn't stop there. Jacob, after the episode of the dream with the ladder and the ascending and descending angels in the beginning of Parshas Vayetze, he makes a vow. This is chapter 28 of Genesis. Vayidor Yaakov Nedelimor. Jacob makes a vow. If God's with me and guards me, he's about, of course, to go to Laban, and he gives me bread to eat and a garment to wear. And I shall return peaceably to my father's home, and God will be to me for a king. And then he promises, this will be the first stone, the first monument of the temple of the house of God, and everything you give to me, I will tithe. So Rashi says, in verse 21 there of chapter 28, what does it mean And I return peaceably to the house of my father? I don't have my level dip. I don't learn from the evil ways of Laban. And God should be for me as a God. His name shall rest upon me from beginning to end. The exact same formula that we saw about Moshe and Aaron and David and Abraham and Joseph, from beginning to end, that's what Jacob wanted. He didn't want to reach great heights, to accomplish amazing things. All he wanted to do was to stay the same, to maintain that level, to not learn from Laban, and to remain true to what he already was. And indeed, when he completes his 20 years with Laban, and he's coming back to encounter Esav in the beginning of Parshas, Vayishlach, we talked about this recently in the Parsha Pachis, of course. He sends messengers to Esav, and he says, Go tell Esav, I lived with Laban, 
says Rashi. What does that mean? What's he hinting? What is he intimating to his brother? I lived with Laban and I observed all 613 mitzvos, and I did not learn from his bad ways. What Jacob coveted, what he prayed for before he got to Laban's house, he got, he earned, 20 years later, he stood up and told Esav, I did not learn a thing from my 20-year sojourn with Laban. That's what he wanted. And that is what he got. There's a deep idea here. If you're righteous, you're always going to be tested. Your level is always under threat. You're always going to be challenged. There are always going to be forces trying to knock you off your game, trying to destabilize you, trying to weaken your resolve. God is always testing the righteous. There's something called the Yetzhara, evil inclination. And the job of the Yetzhara is to try to knock the righteous off their game. And to put the righteous in a situation where the righteous's values get tested. And the giants, the heroes, are the ones who maintain their levels despite all the challenges. They win all the battles against the Yitzhahara. Our sages have a name for the forefathers, for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ha'avos hain hain hamarkava. We're told this in the Midrash. The Ramban brings it a few times. Rashi brings it as well. The Avos, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are the chariot, the Merkava. What does that mean? So imagine, imagine you have a private jet. Wouldn't that be amazing? You don't need to go to TSA pre-check. You don't need to take off your shoes. You don't need to wait for the plane. You don't have to sit next to the people. You fly private. It's a good deal. But what do you do when your private jet, when your Gulfstream needs repairs? Are you going to really fly commercial with the plebs? That's a real problem. That's a real nuisance. You know who doesn't have that nuisance? A monarch. A king. Did you know that the president has two jets? There's two planes that are both Air Force One. Why? In case one of them has to go for repairs, one of them is not operational, the president, the king, always has to have a jet at his or her disposal. What about cars? You know, the presidential Cadillac is a souped-up Cadillac. All kinds of Kevlar and bulletproof and special tires and all kinds of amenities. It's called the Beast. It's the Beast. Apparently, according to the Google search that I just did, there are 10 such vehicles. Why? You got to always have one available. That's a king's chariot. There's always fuel. It's always ready to go. There's never a need for any weight. You'll never have to suffer flying commercial. You'll never be on someone else's timeline on someone else's schedule. We're told that the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were the king's chariot. Whenever God wanted to take them for a spin of prophecy, they were always fueled. They were always ready. They never had to go for repairs. They never had to get a tune-up. They were always spiritually ready for prophecy. What exemplified Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the consistency and never yielding to the disruptions of interruptions. They were bulletproof against all the forces trying to impinge upon them, trying to encroach upon them, trying to destabilize them. So again, we have this high level of consistency, and now we know why that's such a high level. It's such a high level because there's always these forces trying to lower that level, trying to attack that level, trying to knock that person off their perch. And Abe, Isaac, and Jacob are this really high level because 
they never yielded to those forces that were always trying to take a swipe at them. Rebecca, she's praised by the fact that she was not influenced by the tides of her childhood. In the second verse of Parshas Toldos, it tells us that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. Then it tells us the pedigree of Rebekah. Bas Basuel, the daughter of Basuel, Ha'arami, the Aramean, Mipadan Aram, from the place called Padan Aram, Achos Lavan, the sister of Lavan, Ha'arami, the Aramean, Lolisha. That's who Isaac married. Now, of course, we just read that. The whole preceding parsha, Parsha Chayzar, is all about the family of Rebecca and the negotiations that Eliezer had to do with the family to finally earn her hand in marriage for Isaac. This is information we already know. We already know Rebecca's family, her father, her brother, her homeland. So Rashi asked the question there, the second verse of Parsha's told us, don't we really know this information? Who her father is, who her brother is, what her childhood land was like, where she came from? To tell us her praise. She was the daughter of a Russia, of a wicked person. She was the sister of a wicked person. And her homeland, the place that she grew up in, Anche Resha was full of wicked people, the low lambda masem, and she did not learn from their deeds, from their behavior. Rebecca, like all great people, had all kinds of negative influences, yet she resisted it all. She maintained her purity and righteousness despite being in an environment that opposed everything that she stood for. I feel like this is a new definition of greatness. Greatness is not only measured by the height that a person reaches, the great accomplishments that a person has, but by their consistency and resilience and unflappability despite the forces trying to destabilize them. Again, it's not so much about what you accomplished, but how long did you maintain that level for? There's a big debate amongst sports fans. Who is the GOAT? Now, for our large and burgeoning international audience, GOAT stands for greatest of all time. And often it comes down to the guy or the girl who had the greatest prime, but they flamed out a little bit, versus the other person whose prime was not quite as great, but who maintained consistency for a long career. So who's greater? Who's the GOAT? Is it this guy or gal who had a great peak, a great acme, a great prime, but maybe fizzled out a little bit earlier, or the one who had a kind of a less of a high peak, but a longer consistency throughout their career? It seems like the Torah here is praising the giants by their consistency and their continued greatness much more than their one-off peaks. For non-basketball fans, there's a guy whose nickname was The Mailman. You heard of this guy? He was The Mailman. Why? Because he always delivered. He, every game was a good game. He never blew the door off the hinges. He never had like an amazing, amazing game. But there was sustained consistency throughout his career. In the Torah's view, sustained success outshines, you know, one or a few monumental apexes. Perhaps the mailman should get more consideration. Of course, that's not serious. Please don't send me angry sports emails about who the GOAT is. I don't know anything about this. I'm just pontificating from the Torch Center on a Sunday night. Don't take me too seriously. But there is an important idea here. The praise of these giants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moshe and Aaron, David, Joseph, Rebecca, Sarah. The praise of these giants is in their success, in sustaining their levels from beginning to end, not necessarily about the high levels that they attained. And the question is why? Why is this so critical? Why is the maintenance of the level so important. 
So I want to suggest an approach based upon a fascinating midrash. We mentioned this midrash in a podcast nearly two years ago. The Parsha podcast archivists and historians know exactly which one we're talking about. But this midrash is oriented around a fascinating question. Listen to this question. The sages were discussing what is the one verse that incorporates all of Torah. So, of course, every verse is divine. They're all critical. They're all necessary. They're all pregnant with meaning. There's no verse that is extra, that is superfluous. Of course, we all know that. But what verse contains the message that encapsulates what the Torah is trying to do to us? That was the subject of this Midrash. So it tells us that the first opinion, Ben Zoma, he says, I have the verse. I know which verse it is. The first verse that we tell our children, Shema Yisrael, Hashem HaKadosh Mechad, the verse in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the verse of the Shema, the Pledge of Allegiance, where we commit ourselves to God, that is the verse that incorporates really the whole message of Torah. That's the first opinion. The second opinion is the opinion of Benanas. He says, no, I have a different verse. Let's go to Leviticus. Love your fellow as yourself. The golden rule. That one incorporates really what the Torah is trying to get at. What the overarching message of the Torah is. Comes along a third opinion. Shimon ben Paz. He says, I have a verse that really incorporates everything. And what does he say? Es ha-keves ha-echad taseh baboker. You bring the one sacrifice in the morning. You do the second sacrifice in the afternoon, the daily tamid sacrifices that you do once in the morning, once in the afternoon, every single day. That is the overarching message of the Torah. Now, in general, this ministry is really fascinating. The question itself, you know, we're trying to distill the whole Torah into one idea that really incorporates it all. Like, what's the forest? Not just the trees. And the first two really make a lot of sense. The declaration of our allegiance to God. Shema Yisrael, we're accepting God's dominion over everything. God is one. Makes a lot of sense. The golden rule, you should love your fellows yourself. That is an idea that if you want all of Torah while balancing on one leg, Hillel tells us this is it. Makes a lot of sense. But what is so special about the daily Tamid offerings? So the Maharal says something very fascinating. Indeed, no one is claiming that the daily Tamid offering in isolation is something so transformative. You know, after all, it's, it's a sacrifice. There are a lot of sacrifices. But what makes this special is because this is done every single Day. 365 out of 365. On Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Shabbos. On Rosh Chodesh, on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur, on Tisha B'Av, Every single day of the year, with zero exception, the first sacrifice is the morning sacrifice, the morning tummy sacrifice. The final sacrifice of the day is the afternoon tummy sacrifice. And those are consistent. And then he adds something very powerful. The objective of Torah is for man to accept the dominion of God. We start off our life under the dominion of the foreign God. There is an imposter. There is a false God, namely the Yetzirah, and he's in charge. He determines our life. He sits atop the throne, and we genuflect to him. And the objective of Torah is to supplant the false God with the true God to install God as our internal dominion. He's in charge. We're subservient. We're subjugated to him and not to the false God. The quality of subservience, what does it mean? to be subject to a deity, to a master, to a God. It means 
that you are subject to them. You worship them. You serve them at all times. A real servant doesn't have working hours. I'm sorry, it's 5 o'clock Eastern. I'll see you on Monday. Doesn't happen. There's no vacation days. Your identity is you are a subject of your master. The one mitzvah that really encapsulates this idea, the overarching message of Torah, is the daily tamid sacrifices every single day. All of Torah, all such other mitzvahs are to try to get a person to realize that, to incorporate that, to absorb and digest that. Through all the mitzvahs, you become someone who worships God completely. You have completely removed the false God from the throne in your heart. And you've supplanted that with the dominion of the Almighty. But what represents subservience to God? This mitzvah. Because this mitzvah is something which is every single day without fail. The goal of Torah is to be a servant of God. To do something every day, it means that that thing has to be elevated on top of all your other priorities. That thing is sacrosanct. It's bulletproof. It's not influenced by any circumstance. The weather doesn't stop it. The politics don't stop it. The vacation doesn't stop it. The Super Bowl doesn't stop it. Every single day, you got to be in the time of sacrifice, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Those things, the things that you're truly consistent in, those are the things that demonstrate your true commitment to your creator. And this is really what it's all about. You are either a servant of God or of the false God. And the things that you are consistent in, in those things you're a servant of God. And those things that you do sometimes, but you know what? I gotta watch the game. Oh, it's a, it's a busy day at work. Oh, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I'm, I'm not in the mood. I'm not feeling that great. Whatever it is, if there's something that could shake you off that consistency, that means that in that area, you're not, or we're not servants of God. And if we're not servants of God, who's in charge? That's the Yetzirah. That's the false God. It's a scary idea here. The things that we do, but we don't do them consistently. Once they are occasional, once there are lapses in those areas, the Yetzirah, the false God, reigns supreme, which is a terrifying thing. Now, of course... We're humans. I verified last week that the only listeners are humans, or most of the listeners are in fact humans, and we're a work in progress. So let's not get depressed quite yet. But on a principle level, on a philosophical level, there is a tremendous gulf between something that we can give a day up on, something that is still negotiable, in the words of Winston Churchill, we're just negotiating. If it's negotiable at all, it means that you're not a servant of God. There is an amazing picture here that emerges. The things that are yours, the things that you've acquired in your relationship with the Almighty, the things that you'll never give up on, come what may, in that area, it's actually yours. That is what symbolizes your greatness. The themes that stick with you from beginning to end. That is what you've actually acquired in your quest for fostering a relationship with the Almighty. If you have a flash in the pan moment, you're inspired and you do something amazing. Of course, that registers, that matters. That's a wonderful thing. But if that inspiration fizzles out, it's actually not yours. You're having a little bit of a, an out-of-body experience, but it's not something which is eternally yours. 
what we do consistently, completely, and nothing shakes us off of that, not Laban, not Basuel, not going to Egypt, not being a teen in Egypt, not all the miracles that Moshe and Aaron did, nothing, not the vicissitudes of life, whatever they may be, if that remains firm, those things are the things that we truly have in our spiritual arsenal. Those are the things that are truly ours. In those areas, we are truly accomplishing what Torah is trying to do to us. Everything else is still negotiable. It's still in the air. It's still part of the battlefront. You know, we know, and we always advise this, there's a certain model of growth. It's like a ladder. You don't want to skip steps in the ladder because then you'll tumble down, right? You've heard that idea. Take things slow and steady. Slow and steady wins the race. Don't jump too high. Don't reach for the skies quite yet. Do it in a measured fashion. Do it in a calculated fashion. Otherwise, you'll plummet down to the ground. I think there's a deeper idea as to why it's good advice to take things slowly. Even if you do grab up high and you do skip a couple of rungs, we don't want just to do things. We want to earn them. We want to own them. We want to acquire them. We want to incorporate them within us, make it ours, make it something which is non-negotiable, like the daily time of sacrifice for a hundred years, for a thousand years, not miss it even once. We want it to endure. Snatching some random thing here or there is, of course, nice. It could be motivational. It could be aspirational. But it doesn't last. It's not part of who we are eternally. It's not ours. And our objective in this world, the objective of Torah, is the endurance expedition. What's going to endure in this expedition? What are you actually going to earn that's yours and that's unshakably yours? Is there a part of the real estate of your heart that you have cordoned off for God and it's non-negotiable in this area? You are a servant? That's the objective. There's an amazing midrash, again, one we've spoken about in the past. It tells us why did the Jewish people merit to be redeemed? And it tells us that they preserved some things. They didn't change their names. They didn't adopt Egyptian names. They didn't change their clothing. They maintained their culture and their identity. They didn't change their language. There were certain parts of Jewish lifestyle that they preserved and maintained. And the question I always had is, wait a minute, you know, of all things, it's nice to be culturally Jewish. It's important to speak the language and to have that name, the Jewish name, and to have maybe a distinctly Jewish garb. Those are nice things, but they're very small things. Why would this be sufficient merit for the nation to be spared, to be redeemed, to be taken out of their exile? due to these comparatively minor things. And again, this gets back to our point. What was this Egyptian exile all about? What was this Egyptian enslavement about? The Rambam actually writes that Pharaoh is the best metaphor for the Sahara. The Jewish people were completely enslaved to Pharaoh with one or two or three minor exceptions. There was a small, tiny area of their life that they weren't subject to Pharaoh. They weren't subject to the Egyptian way of life. They maintained certain aspects of Jewish culture, of the Hebrew culture, Jewish names, garments, language, things that in the grand scheme of things, you know, is it so important? I don't know how important it is. But in that era, they were not subject to Pharaoh. They weren't subject to the foreign god. And therefore, they were subject to the true god. There was a tiny bit of real estate that was under the dominion and the control of the Almighty. 
And therefore, there's some grounds within them for something to clasp on, so to speak, to grab, something to grab a hold of, to extract the Jewish people from Egypt. We read in the beginning of Parshas Vayechi, the very first Rashi in Parshas Vayechi, Rashi tells us that there is an anomaly to Parshas Vayechi that appears in no other Parsha, and that is that there's no break separating it from the preceding Parsha. Normally, you know, it's a new paragraph, there's a, a few spaces in the Torah scroll from one Parsha to, to the other separating the two. Vayechi begins and there's just right in the middle of a paragraph. So Rashi tells us, why is that so? One of the reasons Rashi tells us, because when Jacob died, that's when the enslavement began. And the Jewish people were all closed up because they were suffering with the enslavement. And therefore, the Torah is also closed up. And there's no open paragraph to symbolize, so to speak, the state of the Jewish people at that juncture of the Torah. Now, the question that everyone asks is, wait a minute, in our parasha tells us, Rashi tells us, our sages tell us, that we are told the age of Levi when he died, because when all the sons of Jacob passed, that's when the enslavement began. And therefore, Levi, who outlived all the other tribes, all of his other brothers, it tells us his age so we can calculate the exact moment when the enslavement actually began. So Rashi, of course, is contradictory. In the first verse of Parshas Vayechi tells us that the enslavement began with the death of Jacob. And in our parasha, he tells us that the enslavement began with the death of Levi, Jacob's son. Which one was it? So my grandfather used to always say is that there's two kinds of subjugation. There is spiritual subjugation, and that began with the death of Jacob. And then there is physical enslavement. That only began with the death of Levi, which was many decades later. What does it mean to be subject to spiritual subjugation, to spiritual enslavement? This is the idea that we're talking about. You have your level. You have your status and stature. And that is going to come under threat. And the threat is the spiritual environment in which you're living. The effects of the environment of Egypt once Jacob died, it altered them. The Egyptian way of life rubbed off on them. They started to become acculturated and assimilated into the Egyptian way of life. The merit that they had to be redeemed was thanks to those things, small though they were, those small tiny things that they did not lose, that were not subject to the Egyptian enslavement, they preserved, they maintained from beginning to end. That was theirs in those small minor areas. God reigned supreme. And therefore, there was a foothold. There was a beachhead in their heart for the redemption to grab onto. This idea, of course, is featured in all kinds of places. For example, Tama tells us, that before a child is born, they are given the instructions of what they need to do in life. And the child is told, the soul is told, you have a holy and pure soul within you. The holiness of your soul rivals the holiness of God himself and the angels. And your job is to preserve and maintain the purity of your soul. Again, the stress, the focus is not about acquiring new things, about earning new things. Just maintain the holiness and the purity that you had initially. And therefore it makes sense. Who are we praising? We are praising the ones who succeeded in preserving and maintaining their level. Moshe and Aaron, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they were consistent from beginning to end and that demonstrates that they, in fact, earned it themselves. The Talmud tells us that if a person has one mitzvah in heaven, they do good to him, and they elongate his days, and he merits to earn the land, 
which we're told means to earn Olam Abba. So how many mitzvahs do you need to do to earn Olam Abba? Well, here we're told, this is the Talmud book of Kiddushin. I think it's on page 40 or 40A or 40B, somewhere around there. Here we're told, you only need to do one mitzvah. With one mitzvah alone, you can earn a portion in heaven. Explain the commentaries. It doesn't mean to do one mitzvah once. It means to own a mitzvah. If there is one mitzvah that you do consistently, come what may, no matter what, it's like the Tamid offering. You do in the morning, you do in the afternoon, and this never, ever, ever changes. That is a mitzvah that you truly own. In that area, God reigns supreme. You already have acquired in this world a portion in the next world. And indeed, once you arrive at the gates of the next world, you have a golden ticket of admission. Even if it's only a small thing. Even if it's only one thing, but something you don't compromise on, something that you're consistent from beginning to end, you have now earned a lasting legacy. There's something that your soul can feed off, can feast upon for all eternity. Now, of course, you'll be challenged on it. That's the design. You probably won't be challenged like Rebecca was challenged. You won't have Basul as a father, most likely. You won't be siblings with the trickiest, wiliest fraudster of all time, Laban. You probably won't live in a land, in a city that is as immersed in sinfulness as where Rebecca grew up. But nevertheless, you will be challenged. And that's why we're urged to not trust ourselves until we are dead. Don't believe yourself till the day you're dead. You're dead. So long as you still have free will, so long as it's possible for you to mess up, you may still do that. We're told that there was a Kohen Gadol, a high priest who served as a high priest for 80 years, walking into the temple, the Holy of Holies, on Yom Kippur, the holiest person in the nation. And after 80 years of holding the highest post that our nation has to offer, he became a heretic at the end of his life. He didn't last. He was not like Moshe and Aaron from beginning to end. He had his great peak, but then he plummeted. He fell precipitously and became a heretic, and he ended off like that. He didn't last. The mark of all the great giants is their consistency. Moshe and Aaron were like that from beginning to end. Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, Rebecca, Sarah, David, Joseph, they were all giants from beginning to end. Now for us, we cannot really hope to be like them because they were perfect in every area. Abraham, of course, represents totality of completion in all areas from beginning to end. They were ready for prophecy at any time of the day or night. They were perfect in every area. But for us, we have a certain model here now that we've learned from this study. It's a good advice for us to find at least some part of ourselves, of our behavior, of our relationship with the Almighty, a mitzvah perhaps, find something that is fixed in stone and immovable. Carve out that one little thing. That thing is yours. In this area, God rules. This is not negotiable. By doing that, you will earn yourself some permanent real estate in heaven. May we all preserve the goodness that we have. May we all find at least that one thing that we're going to cleave to come what may and not allow it to erode no matter what. By doing that, we are emulating the giants of our history and we are earning a permanent place in the eternal world. Okay, let's hit this week's exquisite insight. Are you ready? The final exquisite insight of 2021. So there is an unusual pattern at the beginning of our Parsha. Moshe and Aaron, of course, are featured last week. We read about the birth of Moshe 
and how he escapes to Midian and he rendezvous with Aaron and they go to Pharaoh. But we don't really know where they came from. We don't know their pedigree. And in our parsha, after we had a whole parsha ready to deal with them, to, to study them, to follow their story of Moshe and Aaron, it lists the pedigree of Moshe and Aaron, their descendants of Levi, from the family of Kahas, Amra married Yocheved, we get the whole history. And it starts, of course, with Reuben, gives us the family of Reuben, then Shimon, and then Levi, and then it doesn't continue. It doesn't go through the rest of the children of Jacob, it just does the first three. So there are a few questions. First of all, why does it attribute Moshe and Aaron now? And not when they were introduced last week. And by the way, if I'm not mistaken, this was the A and Q from last year. That's question A. Question B is why attribute Ruvain and Shimon, Levi, of course we know, we have to know the backstory, the pedigree of, of Moshe and Aaron. They come from the tribe of Levi. But why Reuven and Shimon and not all the other tribes? Either do everyone or just do the tribe of Levi and give us the backstory, the antecedents, the progenitors of Moshe and Aaron. So Rashi already gives us two answers to these questions in verse 14. Rashi tells us, well, we needed to be told the story of the tribe of Levi. And therefore, once we're telling us, we don't just start from the beginning, we start from the oldest one, Reuven, then Shimon, and finally Levi, and then really that was the goal. And once we got to the goal, we stop there. That is the first answer Rashi gives us. The second answer I found to be really interesting, Rashi says that when Jacob was on his deathbed, he rebukes the first three of his sons. Reuven, he tells me, you're too impetuous. Shimon and Levi, you have the stolen craft. Of course, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And therefore, as a way to offset, so to speak, the sting of the admonishment of Jacob, the Torah here counts them again and praises them and gives them distinction and honor as a way to offset that. Really interesting idea that Rashi tells us. Rav Hirsch says something fascinating. Moshe and Aaron are about to pull off some of the most impressive feats in history. The Talmud tells us that in history, no slave, even a single slave, had ever escaped from Egypt. And now they're not only going to take out one slave, they're about to extract the whole nation. Moreover, they're going to assemble all the Jews from every corner of the land, gather them all together. And it's going to be in style. What miracles are they going to have? The ten plagues and the further plagues at the sea. You have the Jew and the Egyptian drink of the same glass. Jew drinks water. Egyptian drinks blood. When do you want the fraud stand? Even the magicians throw up their hands in defeat. What Moshe and Aaron are about to do is something very impressive. And there was a concern that someone perhaps would claim that they're not ordinary humans. They are divine. There are a segment of our population, of humanity, that are small people. And they cannot conceptualize how great a soul is or how powerful a soul is. And when they see something that they cannot explain in their small world view, they automatically conclude that it must be divine. But no. Moshe and Aaron were humans like all other humans. And therefore, to banish the mistaken notion, right before they're about to accomplish amazing things, and not Lassie's Parsha. Lassie's Parsha, really, it kind of flopped. But they're about to do great things. The Torah tells us who their parents were. They came from this and this family. Oh, and they're equated with their brothers, Reuven and Shimon. They're ordinary people. Of course, they're very special people, transcendent people, angelic people, prophetic people. But don't make that mistake. I always speculate that Moshe is the most criticized person in the whole Torah, even though he's the greatest one. Perhaps it is for this reason as well. Well, that's that. I thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this Parsha podcast about uh, 3% as much as I did. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week and a fantastic and splendid and wonderful and joyous and harmonious and peaceful and tranquil Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, with the help of the Almighty, we will talk again next week, hopefully in good health and great spirits. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.